Hey everyone, welcome back to the NPT Podcast. This is Will Crane, your host. Thank you so much for joining me as we go through the content you need in order to dominate on test day. So today I've got a practice question for you. This is related to the system interactions section on exam day. So you can expect to see a number of questions on this. So eight to, 20, eight to 10 questions on the system interactions. This is in, entirely dedicated to differential diagnosis prognosis and evaluation. So evaluation, differential diagnosis, prognosis. This is the primary focus of your multi-systems or system interactions type questions. So I've got a question for you related to that. But before I do, just a quick reminder, we are starting up our crash course three weeks before every test day. So this is for PT and PTA. Three, three weeks before your desired test date, we have a crash course to take you through cardio, musculo, and neuro one more time. So this is a great way to see the tips, the tricks, the things that are likely to give you that last little push to get you over the top. This is something that uh, I think is just so much fun to go through this content, this much content to go through it that quickly. It's like cramming, but, but way better because let's be honest, it's a way to go through practice questions and content in sufficient time that you'll remember it but also very proximal to your exam date so that you don't forget it for test day. So, and I just, I got asked this question this last week about when is the most ideal time to begin studying? Well, typically, and my silly answer to that was, well, you should start the day you go into PT school. And obviously the question is, all right, when do you start your, your clear and serious studying for test day? And almost always that what that looks like is somewhere between eight and 12 weeks that, that's a really good target to start because between eight and 12 weeks, that's when you can, obviously the test is close enough that you are, are concerned about it, seeing it, it's very proximal to you. However, it's not so far away, or I guess it is far away enough that you're able to review content, get things to stick, actually improve and remediate any weak areas you may have. So that being said, that's why eight to 12 weeks is a sweet spot. So we start the crash course three weeks before every test day as a way to polish up or brush up on the things that you likely have already studied, but things that you don't want to forget for test day. And so that's one of the great parts about the crash course is we go through cardio, muscular, neuro very, very quickly. Plus we've got some really sweet discounts. If you can get five or more of your cohort together, we can get you in there for basically half price. And so it, it definitely behooves you to get as many of your cohort together because well, let's be honest, it's always nice to save some money, especially as you're heading into test day. I totally get that. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into our practice question for today. So like I said, dedicated to the system interactions section on the exam, as per usual, I will read to you the question. We'll talk about it together and uh, yeah, give you a moment to answer and then we'll talk about the answer together. <laughs> a patient with a history of breast cancer is being evaluated for mid thoracic pain. The clinician observes lower extremity weakness and impaired sensation bilaterally. The patient also reports that the thoracic pain extends in a belt-like distribution and is intermittent but occurs most often at rest. Which of the following conditions is most likely present? We've got one, basal cell carcinoma, two, cauda equina syndrome, three, sarcoidosis, or four, spinal cord compression. So again, a patient with a history of breast cancer is being evaluated for mid thoracic pain. The clinician observes lower extremity weakness and impaired sensation bilaterally. The patient also reports that the thoracic pain extends in a belt like distribution and is intermittent, but occurs most often at rest. Which of the following conditions is most likely present? And so the answer options are basal cell carcinoma, cauda equina syndrome, sarcoidosis, or spinal cord compression. So this question, obviously asking you about a little differential diagnosis, you have a patient with a history of breast cancer and they have a current complaint of mid thoracic pain. In addition to that, lower extremity weakness and impaired sensation bilaterally. Anytime you see bilateral presentation of, of either weakness or sensory disturbances, that should be a, a huge red flag to you. And then finally, the real kicker here is that we see that the pain, although it is in a belt-like distribution, so almost like a dermatomal band, it is intermittent, but occurs most often at rest. So pain at rest, especially if it said night pain, by all these bilateral symptoms with pain that occurs at rest, that's starting to tell you there's probably something, something quite serious going on. And then when you consider that with breast cancer, one of the most likely sites for metastasis is the thoracic spine. That should lead you quite nicely to the to the idea that there could be spinal cord compression. And that is indeed the correct answer here. Spinal cord compression, that's a very common pathological feature of metastasized breast or lung cancer. 
So if you have breast or lung cancer, it is most likely to result in a thoracic spine or th some type of thoracic spinal cord compression or thoracic metastasis. And if you've got some type of colon or pelvic carcinoma, that's likely to result in a lumbar or sacral issue or lumbar or sacral metastasis. So in this case, something to watch out for is after breast cancer or, or any type of lung cancer, watch for, for metastasis into the, the thoracic spine. So all that to say, what we're seeing here is that belt-like pain distribution. So it often follows the dermatomal band near the site of the compression. In addition to that, you'd have distal symptoms. So in this case, we've got paraplegia basically, where we have weakness and impaired sensation in bilateral lower extremities. And then uh, the pain occurs most often at rest. It's quite intermittent, but occurs most often at rest. Could include night pain. Um, these are all indicators of a spinal cord compression. Now, cauda equina syndrome is kind of its own separate category here. So that would be the most popular incorrect answer here, cauda equina syndrome. This is when you have lumbosacral spinal compression. So it's not often or probably won't result in mid thoracic pain. And the other thing that it's less likely to present as, I mean, I guess it could have bilateral lower extremity weakness and sensory disturbances, but it is more likely to have saddle area anesthesia. So saddle anesthesia, loss of bowel and bladder function, uh, likely hitting a lot. Uh, you'd have abnormal rectal tone. Uh, there could be a number of issues related to bowel or bladder that are more likely to be seen with cauda equina syndrome. So although it is true that cauda equina syndrome could result in lower extremity weakness and sensation loss, uh, the more likely case is that you'd have lumbar pain with saddle anesthesia. And so that being the case, the most correct answer here is with the history of breast cancer and mid thoracic pain, it's most likely to be what's called spinal cord compression. And it's just basically you get a metastasis or a tumor or carcinoma that starts growing inside of the spinal canal. One of the, the most common sites for metastases to show up. All that is most likely to result in, in spinal cord compression, talking about central spinal cord compression. These other answer options, basal cell carcinoma, so that's a skin cancer. It typically does not metastasize, and it's where the bottom layer of the epidermis starts to grow. It results in these pearly colored papules and scaly plaques, uh, very pale scar-like tumors start showing up on the skin. Again, rarely metastasizes. However, it can result in open ulceration. And so if you let that go too long, then clearly there's some, some damaging sequelae to that. But basal cell carcinoma is, is rarely metastatic. And then finally, the last incorrect answer is sarcoidosis. So sarcoidosis, this is a multi-system autoimmune disease. And its most common presentation is pulmonary fibrosis with widespread, especially integumentary granulomas. These little granules are basically, it feels a little bit cancerous, but it starts showing up everywhere. So a lot of times the ones you observe are on the skin and the, like on the face. However, it can occur on many systems and organs. Uh, the point is that sarcoidosis is a multi-system autoimmune disease. And the thing you'll most likely encounter on test day related to sarcoidosis would be pulmonary fibrosis. So keep that in mind. Pulmonary symptoms related to sarcoidosis. All right, so there you go. There's your question about the history of breast cancer. That's a key part of this because the common metastatic site or the common site of metastasis is in the thoracic spine. And then remember the, the, the when you have a person has colon or pelvic carcinoma, that's likely to result in lumbosacral metastases, which is most likely to result in the cauda equina syndrome. So spinal cord compression, that's thoracic cord compression. That's uh, again, occurring as a result of a metastasis. And I just want to point out too, just semantically here as well, the spinal cord ends, the official spinal cord ends at L1. At that point, it divides out into its nerve roots and we call that the cauda equina. So technically the cauda equina is not the spinal cord, although it is in the spinal canal, it is, they're the nerve roots that occur or that come off of the spinal cord. So uh, any, anytime you see that, just remember the spinal cord ends around L1 and at that point it separates out into the cauda equina or the horse's tail as it would be referred to. Excellent. All right. So good question talking about multi-systems. Uh, I definitely would recommend going over some of these concepts, especially related to cancer. That's one of the things that is very likely to show up on test day. They want to know if you can safely and effectively identify red flags in a patient. And that's really just one of the big things about 
about the test is they want to know, are you a safe and effective and direct physical therapist, or can you safely, directly, and effectively work with a patient with a multitude of conditions? All right, so with that, we'll bring it to a conclusion here today. I know that I talk about it a lot in some of the other episodes, but if you haven't yet, it only takes just a moment. Give us a, a like, a share, a subscribe. As we're going through this content, we've just seen seen so many people download and enjoy the podcast, which is truly a joy and a pleasure for me. There's a lot of people who could benefit from this, and by you simply liking, sharing, subscribing, it makes a world of difference. In a, in a real sense, you're helping other students study for and prepare for the test by helping us get the word out. So if you haven't yet, uh, you can do not just me a solid, but you can do all of your other uh, all, all of your other PT associates out across the, really across every jurisdiction. Do them a solid too by uh, helping us with a like, a subscribe, a share. Leave us a five-star review. It helps so much as we're getting this podcast out. So, all right, we'll bring it to a conclusion. Thanks again for all you do. Appreciate what you do. And uh, as always, keep a grin on your chin. I'll talk to you all in the next episode. Have a fabulous day, everyone. We'll crank fist pumps all around.